to pay attention to our time here today, so I'm not running on too far. Um, so Richard Avedon, uh, celebrity portrait photographer, if you go to the link that I gave you here, you might recognize some of these images, very well known uh, photographer. This one was all the rage when I, in the 80s. I think I even had that poster in my room. Um, but you can see here, you know, celebrity after celebrity. What Avedon became most well known for is this, this glowing white background with people just against the, the white background and photographed. Um, you can see his earlier work. He started out as a fashion photographer, actually started in the Navy as a photographer. He, I don't think he'd even used a camera before. This one of his most famous images from, um, what year is this one? It's called Davina with the Elephants. And it's the one that sort of made him very well known. Uh, that one was in 1955. So again, kind of an older one. You see these from the 80s, uh, the 70s. This glowing white background is what he sort of became most well known for. Um, and the thing with that glowing white background was that it reduced the portrait to just about the people in it. And at first that seems like, okay, they're just in front of the camera. But what I want you to notice is how very similar poses can be, it, it, it's that idea of, of somebody in a quiet room yelling or not even yelling, just some, a whisper in a quiet room you notice. So when we look at this, you know, if we had a background and everything, you wouldn't notice the sort of firm arms across, you know, the waist, the sort of the look on her face, all of those sorts of things. And, and each one of those little things is a signifier and they have meaning with them. You know, this one, an early one from 50s. And again, before the glowing white background, but very well known, Marilyn. But not what you expect from Marilyn, not the sort of looking at the camera kind of confidence. You know, this looks like somebody a little bit lost, a little bit out of it. Now, you know, which, which is it? The persona that we're used to seeing or this one? Was this just happened to be a down moment? We don't know, except that these are the photographs that we have. So when we look at, at Avedon photographs, let me go back up here to the beginning. This, one of my all time favorite Richard Avedon photographs. And, you know, what I've asked you to do is to photograph people. Now he's using studio lighting. So he's bringing a fashion aesthetic to this kind of image. And, you know, this guy would be interesting enough just, you know, I don't know whether he has alopecia or, or what, but he doesn't seem to have any hair on his body. He seems to be kind of an albino guy, but I don't think it's albino. I think it's that other, I think it's alopecia where you just don't have any hair or anything. Maybe no skin tone, uh, I don't know. That would be interesting enough. But look at the bees all over him. And he's a beekeeper. So when I ask you to use an interesting prop, you know, the bees would be interesting enough, but the way he shoots him, you know, no, the way he photographs him. The bees are crawling on his ears. They're on his nipples. It's, it just makes me squirm. But the look on this guy's face like, bees? What bees? It's like he's the king of the bees and they're just all around. I mean, it's just a great photograph. Um, and so when you look at these, that's, I want you to, to pay attention, you know, that they are about these portraits, but about they're about simple gestures. They're about these props that are brought in, in a way, and not just that the props are interesting, but the way the people are photographed with those props. And that's not an easy thing to do. It seems very simple, but these are really kind of amazing. This is uh, Shirley Chisholm, Congresswoman, 1976, again. But look at the way she's dressed. It's this sort of militant thing, you know, very sharp, you know, the, her hands to her side. Um, you know, very powerful, very sort of confrontational. This one here, Chet Baker, if you don't know who he is, he's a horn player. You know, you have the wrinkles, but it's almost like he's falling. You know, and Avedon knows how to frame a photograph. 
he's using the space, you know, he's using that chin falling out of the frame as if this guy's just sort of melting away. And if you know Chuck Baker, you know, he had a heroin problem and he did just sort of end up melting away. Um, talk about an interesting Here's a rattlesnake skinner, and these are from different groups of Avedon. I'm going to quickly, his criticism in Nintendo. Here's Francis Bacon, and if any of you are art people, you might know who Francis Bacon is, he's a painter. But again, using the frame as this guy sort of just wanting to get away, like, oh, are you done yet? You know, it's that moment of, uh, I'm not quite here in the, in the frame. Whereas, you know, George W. Bush, you know, very hands in the pocket, like, what, I'm a cool guy. You know, this is when he, before he was even, this is the first George Bush uh, when he was the director of the CIA, I believe. Yeah. You know, it's like, what? Nothing to see here. Well, uh, OK, I'm just a guy in a tie. You know, OK, can, can we get this over with? You know, so it is that sort of feeling. You know, when you look at Twiggy with the way he shot her hair all all flowing up, you know. Um, so as you go through these, or I, I would hope that you go through them, you know, talk about a fast shutter speed. This was another one that was a very famous image of him. You know, she almost looks as if she's floating through through the city. Um, you know, Truman Capote, a, a writer, you know, uh, is very young here. But look at that pose uh, compared to, you know, a very feminine pose, the exposed neck, vulnerability, the eyes closed, not engaging the camera, you know, the, the thinness of his body, all of those things. Um, coming together in that photo. There's two that I always want to compare and I don't know if I have them here. I may have to come back and talk about uh, Avedon a little bit more. We may have to revisit him. Um, in fact, let me go to So that's the moral random. Oh, here, here are the two of them. So I want you to look at these two different photographs. And here's the Marlon Brando one, a very well-known one. And you can see him shaved, you know, it's it's him shaving in the mirror. All these very masculine sort of things, you know, it, the way he's lighted from the side sort of shows his muscles. You don't really see his face, but he's shaving. That's not enough. You know, if that's not masculine enough, we'll put a cigarette in his hand and a, and a towel over his arm, like he's just come back from the gym. And it's almost like you're the, the, the bathroom mirror looking at him, but very masculine, every signifier in there, very tough guy sort of thing. And then let's take a look at the Liam Neeson photograph. Shot from the waist up, same thing. But instead of him ignoring you, he's looking right in the camera. He's also shirtless, but it's, it's shot, you know, he looks a little softer. You don't see the muscles, but that pose like, oh, don't hurt me. And I guess this is before Liam Neeson was, you know, the tough guy from <coughs> one of those movies taken or whatever. But again, shot very similarly, but a whole different feeling to that person. And that's what I want you to understand. As you make these photographs, as you make photographs of Where have I been? Um, as you make photographs, you are deciding how a person is 
represented, represented, a representation. This You are making a representation of that person. You are deciding how we will see them, okay? So Avedon, you know, is, is interesting because it doesn't seem like there's much in his photographs. But when you really look at them, you can see all the things happening in those photographs. David LaChapelle, on the other hand, way over the top in his photos. And well, the internet so bad today. It's just coming up. Oh, shouldn't things be better by now? All right, so these are David LaChapelle. Uh, photographs. And what I want you to see is how over the top they are. Now, we also, oh, this is gonna take too long, let me, See if I can get the video to work. All right, I'm struggling too much with my internet today. Well, let me try something different then. Let me try hot spotting myself. All right. We have a pillow problem. You know, we're all different and all these companies are. My real love is. All right. So this is a short video on David LaChapelle. It's his studio. He's actually a studio is in Los Angeles. We saw Gregory Crutzen the other day who works on these big sound stages and all that kind of stuff. And even Boyd Webb, uh, a big studio. David LaChapelle works in a very similar way, these big sort of places. And so I want you to see what his studio looks like and, and what he's doing. He is doing the still image and feeling this as creating these scenes or creating these tableaus and stories and narrative um, where you're doing, reaching people through an image. That's my love. I love, I love the power that's, in, that's in, within that still image. This is where we do all of our woodworking and set building. And uh, above us is, is prop storage. And then this is one of our sykes in here. Um, this is a uh, workroom, editing room. I like to be back here, it's quiet. And the lights so that um, the color balance lights. The photography really is about color and 
This is where we watch movies and stuff. So everybody take a seat and watch a movie. I grew up in Connecticut. Then at 15 years old, I dropped out of school and uh, came to New York. I was already going to New York around 14 years old, taking the train. It was a 45 minute train ride or an hour train ride from on Grand Central. <clears throat> Got to started going to nightclubs. I started going to discos and nightclubs in Connecticut. And then we started going to New York. It really was big, big time for dancing. And so it was just a great time to come of age. And I had all these really cool friends in New York, you know, and they weren't that much older than me. I mean, they were 18, 19, or 20, but I felt, you know, pretty mature at that time, even though I wasn't. Um, and I moved in with this girl on Vanessa on First Avenue and First Street. She worked at CBGB's, which was a nightclub. And I got a job at 254. So she'd always tease me because I was like going to the, you know, what she thought was like a fruity, like it was like an uptown club. She was like downtown, but I would go to both. You know, I'd go to Mud Club and CBGB's and and then there'd be, you know, Studio 54 because I liked the glamour and I also liked, you know, hanging out downtown where I lived in the East Village. Then I was 17 and my dad came. Um, I always kept in touch with my parents. You know, they were, they were great. And my dad was like, you really... He finally just was like, you gotta just try to finish high school. Like, you can't just be sitting in New York another year. And we'd heard about this art school in North Carolina um, called school, school, North Carolina School of the Arts in Winston-Salem. And they accepted me. They let me in as a senior. I never graduated because I didn't have enough credits. But um, halfway through our senior year, we, we took a photography, had a photography um, intensive like for the second half of the year. And I just, I knew right then, you know, at that school that photography was it and I, I never really finished a drawing or painting like really finished drawing painting I, I still sketch and sketch ideas and stuff but that really um it was it for me it was just a great place to meet um other young artists whether they were dancers or, or visual artists or musicians just like-minded kids it was really incredible and from that school I came back to New York um, when I was 18 and um, just picked up where I left off. And my friend had a loft on, on 23rd uh, Park Avenue South and um, she was working in the fashion business at the time and she was a couple years older than me and we were best friends and I said she was in her dark room. She had a dark room in there. Space of, of my photographs. And that was 84 and I called it um, First show was Good News from Modern Man. The first photos I did were um, black and white. I printed it all myself. You know, I was doing a lot of experimenting with bleaching on prints. There was a lot of um, interest in the metaphysical, playing with magic and un or the unphotographable, the idea of the soul or life after death um, was pretty heavy on my mind. And nude, figurative, natural light, black and white, heavily Renaissance inspired. I started working for an interview with, with the second show um, at Lisa's Gallery in 84. We did a show three months later uh, called Angle Scenes and Martyrs. And that show got, um, I kept bringing my pictures back to the offices of the interview because he said, so there's a picture. So from 84 to 87, I started, I was showing in galleries and working at an interview, which, you know, just getting published was really exciting. And I thought, you know, the first picture the Beastie Boys ever published was mine and just getting these great assignments, you know, like meeting all these cool people and just getting your picture printed in a, it was an oversized magazine and wound up taking the last portrait of Andy, like formal portrait of him before he died, just a couple of weeks before he died. We didn't know, of course, it, he was going to die, you know, we thought that he was so young. I was just in love with photography and wanting to give something to the world rather than, I don't know, this this idea of like, I never thought I was gonna make money or notoriety or things like that never really crossed my mind, honestly. Like it was more about what can I give rather than what, what, am, what am I gonna get, you know, out of it or something. Um, especially when my friends started dying of AIDS and things like that, I wanted to do pictures that were uplifting. I never wanted to, to create more confusion or darkness or ugly things and my you know and then that's a, a relative term because what's ugly to me may not be ugly to you or what's beautiful to me may not be beautiful to you but i had to just be really truthful with myself or honest and take pictures that i thought were beautiful later you know it started seeing more celebrities and stuff like that but it was you know an unplanned journey 
or say, why don't you show your sets or show, you know, galleries that my head would explode if I started doing installation. I keep it to photography just to give myself parameters. So when I was doing this Midnight Circus, I was just so glad to be involved because I love Midnight Life and dancing. I think it's a great release. Um, project this in my mind is just an opportunity to, to to create something you know that will wind up in photographs anyway and wind up sort of in, in, as a sort of memorable snapshot of mine if not a, if not a, a real photograph probably both so i just think of it as a set piece for photograph i like short form film uh like commercials and videos and stuff but you know music videos aren't really the, the last one we did was florence and machine spectrum um a few weeks ago and that was a lot of fun she's super nice when we first came here, we were cold and we were clear, with no colors on our skin. We were lying in the first time. Something that was once done only by men could be the key to taking years off your appearance. Sorry, I didn't know that YouTube does that now in the middle of videos. No, this is an, another shooting area. This is where we, um, one of the Florence sets was. Um, we had it rigged so light could come through the floor and lights were back here and chandelier. So I like to recycle sets and use them over and over, repaint them. I don't like to um, really try to be as economical as possible with saving uh, resources and also, you know, just, it's just, so having a, a nice studio like this in LA, we can keep a lot of the flats and we use them over and over, we paint them. And instead of having to build, build them and chuck them out. So I, I, I'm a, you know, we use all these elements and we configure them into different, de depending on what shoots we're doing. This is where we shot the dance sequence of Florence. Um, but we use this, I mean, I use it for everything. So these, these, these sykes, there's three of them in the studio that we can use. Um, because it doesn't have any square walls, it kind of goes into this big void and looks much bigger than it is. To me, that that's the magic of art when you connect, like when you hear a song. Ah, oh, that what I'm feeling. I'm, I felt I've been there. You know, that, you know, or or just the the, the note and tone of of the music, the melody that haunts you, that stays with you. I, I, you know, strive for my photographs to have that same impact and the same feelings. So when you walk into a gallery or a museum, exhibition or something, you see that, and you get, I mean, that's what I strive for. That's sort of the goal. Okay, so that's David LaChapelle.